All right. So uh, the last session, we're going back in time. The old classic. So when I chose this, I thought it was nice. And I could see some connections with last week's text, with uh, the Anna Arendt text. So anyone who saw a nice connection, I would like to mention it. No? Well, I checked your writing. I think all of you wrote something. So you must have seen something. Um, Elke, you went here last time. Did you read Hannah Arendt's text? Uh, yes, qu rather quickly when I saw the first uh, assignment. But you, you found a connection. Yes, I'm just struggling to open my Google Doc here. Yeah, I think I got it. So what's the connection you saw? Um, well, like I said, I didn't spend too much time on Hannah Arendt, but I noticed in her last, on the last page, she wrote something um, that seemed a bit similar to what Lao Tse is saying, which is about how we have experiences that cannot be caught with words. We can hardly describe them. That's a connection that I saw. Yeah, okay, that's your last say. And what does uh, Anna Arendt say? She speaks about us being earthbound creatures, yeah. but we pretend to be bigger and dwellers of the universe, she calls it. Um, but we will not be able to understand, that is, to think and speak about the things which, nevertheless, we are able to do. So that would be the connection. Things that yeah. are impossible to speak of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you have an idea what these things might be? That we can <laughs> speak of, can we can even think of them? Uh, well, here we have a slippery, slippery slope already, because how can I explain to you what these things are if we can't I don't know. them? Look, have, have, <laughs> have you read uh, Tao Te Ching? Have you read no. no. Maybe read bits the, and pieces, but yeah, not. Did you read the beginning, the first verse. Of uh, Lao Tse, you mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You remember he says that uh, the Tao that can be spoken of is not the Tao. Uh, you you mean in the verse that you sent us, right? No, no I mean the first verse of the book. Of love. Then I no, I don't know it, but I I have heard. Yeah, so the the Tao that can be walked. So Tao means a way, basically. The Tao that can be walked. It's not the Tao, hmm. and the Tao that can be spoken of is. It's not the real Tao. So basically, you cannot, you cannot speak of it. You cannot talk of it. You cannot get it. But then the whole book, he does nothing else but speak of the Tao. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. Maybe it's impossible to speak of it, but still, we we can try. Mm. Do, you, do you have an, any idea, any sense? what he might talk, be talking about here. Well, not a, a concrete idea just yet. Yeah. It does remind me, however, of Wittgenstein that also said something similar, something like that which we cannot speak of. We must be silent or something. Yeah. So I, I think philosophers tend to agree that there's this something that we can experience and we can describe it and there we find that language is a barrier after all because you can circle around it but you can never quite get to the core yeah okay so these things that they talk about here are still a mystery to you 
Both the lapses and our unspeakable things. Well, I would imagine there would be experiences where we transcend ourselves, our practical daily lives, mm -hmm. which is very hard to describe even yeah. to ourselves. Yeah. So uh, anyone else would like to give it a try? If you can put any words to these, these things that we cannot speak of. What do you think Lao Tzu is referring to? What do you think Arendt is referring to? Yeah, Ian. I can give it a try, but maybe uh, being or pure being. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you try to speak of it, you... <clears throat> already limiting it to some this and that, some attributes. And when you limit being to having some attributes, you deny others. So it's not uh, it's not the pure or the complete being. It's the partial being. So when you speak of it, you speak of the partial being. Yes. When you already articulate sentence about it mm. you kind of uh, I don't know like catch a sample of it but not the, the, the entire yeah and you have a feeling of the entire being can you sense it it's even beyond imagination I think Lao Tzu seems to to say that yes that uh, you might have let's say if, even if you cannot speak about it uh, or make let's say scientific or rational judgments you can still have let's say an intuitive uh, knowledge of it and what about you do you have an intuitive knowledge of it this being uh, not sure no it's rather not so. I have let's say more uh, not being in the not only in the ontological way, but an ontological and let's say ethical way, like the the, <clears throat> the nature of, of being or the, the, the natural way of unfolding of everything that is. Sometimes I'm, I have a feeling that that's in me as well, as in the entire universe. Mm -hmm. This uh, uh, like, be, not being part, but have, having the same substance as everything else and uh, going or unfolding or uh, existing in the same, let's say, rhythm or way. So, 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 yeah, I, so, Experientially, sometimes I have this feeling, this intuitive uh, experience. But do you think you're unique, or do you think it's it's common? I think it's it's common. I don't think. And since one of, one of the questions was if this is relevant today, do you think this idea today? Do you think it's widespread, or it's rather rather particular? Well, your general idea that everything is part of everything. Mm, I'm not sure if it's uh, widespread. Uh, but uh, I see the, the, the question, yeah, the idea is irrelevant uh, because of this uh, transformations and 
pro the production of, of artificial, we seem to not know what is true or what is not true. What's, let's say, natural way of existing and what is not. And this is that, question is... This artificiality, does it bring us closer to the being closer to nature, or does it remove us from it? I think it, it removes us from uh, by making us forget, uh, let's say, this question, what is the, the nature, what is the natural way of, of existing, of being? Yeah. It, in my opinion, this artificiality has, let's say, uh, it imposes uh, implicit answer that there is no being that we can just there's just dead matter we can manipulate it however we want yeah i blame descartes for this <laughs> i think it started with plato already but uh, descartes really split the body and soul so there is man's soul and there is god everything else is just dead matter yes but at least he recognize uh, cog cogito uh, yeah. as being something alive but now we we even tempted to say that no thinking is just algorithms dead algorithms yes indeed today yeah. we've gotten rid of the soul it doesn't exist exactly so everything is dead matter nothing else are you familiar with um, john Donne, the english poet uh so yeah, I've heard of it, but I haven't. Uh, uh, here's a poem. I haven't read the poem. Um, no man is an island. Ah, yes. Yeah. No man is an island, and in it he says, "Do not ask for whom the bell tolls; it tolls for thee." Ah, uh, yes. It's the death bell. When someone died, they rang the bell. So when you hear the death bell, you don't have to ask who is dead, because you know, whoever died, you also died, because everyone is part of everything. So when something dies, a part of you also dies. This is another way of seeing the world yeah? as connected, like you said, that you have a f sense, a feeling that your being is part of a greater being, which is ex expressed in this poem, which is rather dif different from the idea that everyone is an individual and that there is no fundamental connection between anything. Mm. But then you would be more on John Don's side. Huh? Um, I mean, with Lao Tse, I'm more, I was thinking of the ancient uh, pre Socratics that uh, who asked the question of let's say of being what what is that which subsists in all this transformation and all the you know all this becoming is there first something that uh, remains and second does it have let's say any logic or is just uh, let's say blind Uh, you're on mute, uh, Matthias. We don't hear you, Ma Matthias. Hmm? I muted myself. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Um, yes, so, so what do you think? That it's logic or it's blind? Um. Yeah, I I tend to think it's it's logic. It's uh, this reason of of being of everything that exists. It's not just I don't know arbitraries and uh, 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 accidental successful experiment of different stuff that happened in universe. It has in itself a, a reason like a, a rational uh, kind of logic logos so i'm i'm let's say striving towards that every the, the reason of everything that is 
it's also logic or rational. So in the beginning, there was Locos. Uh, well, I would put them together, Logos and Being. No. And um, perhaps this is what Lao Tzu... Uh, but, but there is Logos in Being. Yes, yes. It's it's a uh, logos, yeah. and uh, when we forget about, let's say, this question or this concept of being, everything that is in me, in my actions, uh, in society, and in let's say in matter, uh, if I forget about this principle, can uh, I depart myself or we as as uh, humanity as society from uh, from logic from the core of uh, logic of rational yeah all right good anyone wants to comment on this have an idea or insight no you were too heavy, Ian. Too much, everyone. But let's check your, uh, yes, your difficulties. It was the last question here. If there was anything difficult to understand in the text. So, uh, okay, I'll talk to you, Ian. Let's, let's start with Andrea. Can you read your number three, the difficulty you had? Uh, yes. Uh, um, so, I don't understand the apparently logical link between the following first part and the following second one. Either lead or follow, either blow hot or cold, either have strength or weakness, either have ownership or take by force therefore the sage eliminates extremes eliminates excess the conclusion the conclusion is not clear to me yeah let's see anyone who think they can explain it this is the conclusion No. Yeah, I'll get try. Uh yes, I'll try. I'm not sure. So I think the sage is um he is he means the wise person. Yeah. And in the first part he takes extremes. So he takes lead or follow, hot or cold strength or weakness so he takes opposing concepts mm -hmm. and the conclusion is i think only a fool deals with opposing concepts the wise eliminates these excesses does this make sense or uh let's check with andrea what do you think does it make sense uh yes it does. Yeah. Yeah. There's still something not clear, but it makes sense what I can yes. What is not clear? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's not clear. Um, Okay, uh, let's say, okay, I understand that uh, he's speaking about extremes fact uh, in the first part, but uh, <laughs> uh, let's say that um, 
it doesn't speak about those extremes part in a negative way. So I'm a bit surprised that at the end uh, he, he he concludes with therefore the wise man yeah. has to blah blah blah. So yeah, and we can also add because you didn't include the first line. Oh yeah, the the, the... small things. So this looks like it defeats Elke's explanation. It's not just the fool. It says all things either lead or follow. Yeah, exactly. Either blow hot or cold. Yeah. Either has strength or we either have. Therefore, the sage eliminates extremes. Yeah. But can we can we still make sense of it in some way? Uh, yeah, I was checking the the previous sentence. Maybe it could help as well. That is, the one who controls it will fail. The one who grasps it will lose. Does all things. And, huh? So yeah, can you explain? Yeah, maybe a possible explanation could be that if you try to control the let's say the world, the becoming, you you will try to go out from the becoming, so you don't accept the becoming, and uh, and one way to accept it is uh to to do like the wise man, like to to to. To be in harmony with the becoming, not be extreme and and not going to the exact point. Yeah. So I think the control concept can help to understand this conclusion. So if lead and follow are extremes, then what happens if you eliminate extremes? What do you do? Uh, you, you neither follow, neither, uh, lead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then what do you do? You have a concept for this behavior? Uh, you stay, you, you're, uh, I don't know, you... You uh... but remember he's talking about the world here and he yeah. says the world either you lead or you follow that's the condition for all things but then the sage he should eliminate he says Yeah, that's the problem. Uh, that's the problem. <laughs> is, is it mission <laughs> or can it be solved? Oh, you're asking anyone else? Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm checking with you now. Okay, so, say again the question. Yeah. Here. yeah. So, so is it is it impossible to do this, or or do you think it's is there a way? You, you mean neither follow neither lead. Yeah, let's say that's the condition of all things. It either leads or follows. But you're the sage, you should do neither. Can it work? Uh, yeah, it doesn't explain how. That's the problem. So I, I, can, I could try to <laughs> think. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I know, I don't know. For example, by contemplating, you are not leading and you are not uh, following, neither. So, knowing or contemplating, or yeah, yeah, you have a different relationship with world, which is neither one and the other option. So, what what would that relationship be? Different. Oh yeah, maybe you don't try to modify the world. 
you try to understand it or to contemplate it. So in a way you accept it, the world. You don't try to change it. So then would you be with the world or would you be outside of the world? <laughs> uh, let me check with the text. Uh, because after, uh, it's, without going out the door, know the world. Mm. So in a way, you are still in the world you are not going out. <laughs> um, I would say you are still in the world, yeah. but in a different, with a different disposition, the relationship with the world. Yeah. yeah. So you don't change the world, you change the relationship with it. Yeah, okay. Good. Anyone wants to to add something to it. Yeah, Anna? Yes. Um, maybe we can have another interpretation of um, therefore the sage eliminates extremes. Mm -hmm. Maybe it doesn't mean to uh, for him to, to not be in the leading or the following, but not to be in a the either uh, uh, either uh, state, um, which means <laughs> to be um, only in one way and not a, an, a, another, to be prisoner of just one way, yeah. like only in the leading or only in the following, because it seems that it's what happens to things. It's either this way, either that way. And so maybe to eliminate extremes is to be able to, to wave between uh, different opposites, not, be, not being stuck in just one way. Mm -hmm. So that rather than having none of them, you should be able to have both of them. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And do you see it as having both at the same time or you move from one to the other? Sorry, I didn't get you. Do you see it as you have one at a time that you either lead or you follow from different times or you, you, you're you able to be in both at the same time? Um. I think, yes, it can be to have both at the same time. Yeah. And how does that work? How do you lead and follow at the same time? Um, you want me to give a concrete example, for example? <laughs> if you have one. <laughs> I'm not good for a concrete example. Well, I'm going to give an abstract example. Uh, neither, but wait, just a sec. Um, well, I was thinking of dancing. In, it's true that in dance, it's normally whether you lead, whether you follow. Mm. Um, but still, you can think that Okay, you can be the, the leader of the dance, but still you follow the energy of your partner. You are not in a complete leading of everything. Mm. You have space to to be uh, in some yeah, little following of what the other partner expresses. So this could be an example, maybe. Yeah. Yes. And uh, could be also for uh, a sage to lead, for example, when he gives some advices for other people, 
but still he will try to follow some rules of the Tao, for example. So he's not stuck in just a leading uh, attitude, but yeah. he can be able to follow some higher rules, for example. Can we use a workshop as an example of this? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. I think yeah, a good workshop is when you're able to 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 keep the lead so it doesn't become chaos. But at the same time you are able to follow what people expresses. Mm. Otherwise you are rigid and you are not available to others' ideas, others' presence. Yeah. Okay, that's nice. I didn't think of it like this, but yes, it can be a guide for practitioners as well. Yeah. yeah, good. Anyone else on this? Or could this be an example of the things that we cannot speak of? which we talked about in the beginning, the things we cannot talk about. Maybe this this is one of these unfathomable things which we can sense, but what to put words on. Andrea, what do you think? Yeah, I, I like the idea of Anna, uh, but I have a, a little problem with the second part, mm -hmm. this, which is to interpret uh, the two extremes way uh, uh, co co coexist at the same time. And I, I like the, the example of the workshop, but I think that also in the workshop, there is uh, some moments you you lead more the, the group mm -hmm. and other moment that you let it go and you follow more the group. So you can distinguish the moment when you lead them, when you... Uh, you follow and but and in this case do you think you eliminated the extremes or you kept them you yeah yeah you you, you keep the extremes yeah you change relationship i mean you are not stuck with one extreme but you you, you still keep the extremes yeah So and you sense. think that goes along with excess and arrogance? Do you think leading, let's, yeah, do you think leading necessarily is excessive and arrogant? Not, not, not necessarily, no. No. But if you, if you lead, you say you keep the extreme. But here okay. you see lead in itself as an extreme. So it's as soon as there is leading, you, you are in this extreme. Or can there be leading which is not extreme? Mm. I, uh, that, that, that's a nice question. I, I, I think it's possible. I, I'm not sure if uh, Lao Tzu thinks it's possible. <laughs> but I think it is. You know, this concept of a wu way of doing nothing or non action, you heard of it? Yeah, wu way is the uh, the second principle after the Tao, right? Uh, no, it's the de. The de, okay. So Which wu way is, is yeah, taking action, and wu way is taking no action. Taking knowledge? No, no action. Oh, no action, okay. Taking no action. So the idea is that you lead without leading. Ah, okay. You rule. The ruler should rule without ruling. Ah, okay. May, okay. If you want to win a fight, you fight it by not fighting. 
it's like the wooden rooster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you when you try to do something and you really try that, no, that's not the way to do it. You should, you know. Okay. Don't try and do it. Yeah. No, now I understand. Without actually trying to accomplish it. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Yes. There's um. <clears throat> Now it's the story about the best teacher. So, so they say um, a bad teacher is a teacher which uh, the students are scared of. That's a bad teacher. A good teacher is a teacher which the students admire. But the best teacher is a teacher that the students don't even realize that they have been taught. <laughs> and after the class, they will say to the teacher, but you didn't teach us anything. We learned everything by ourselves. And then you know you're a really good teacher. Okay, so the best teacher is Socrates, maybe. <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, you teach without teaching. Yeah, nice. Okay. So it's possible to speak about these things, right? <laughs> well, know, we're speaking about them, so. <laughs> okay. okay, but there's there's another story in Chuangzi, where a guy goes to the Yellow Emperor, and he says, first I went to this guy, and I wanted to talk to him about the Tao, and he said, well, I don't know, I have no idea. Then I went to another guy, and I said, can he you tell me about the Tao? And he said, yeah, I, and he started to talk about it, but then he stopped and he said, no, I, I forgot. So can you tell me about the Tao, Emperor? And the yellow emperor, yeah, I told him everything about the Tao. And then the emperor stopped and he said, no, wait a minute. The first guy you went to, he knew it. He knew it because he had no idea. The second guy you went to, he almost knew it because he forgot it. But you and I, we think that we know it. So basically we have no idea. So if we're talking about it and we think we know what we're talking about, it means that we have no idea what we're talking about. Yeah. So basically, uh, the language uh, betrays the Tao. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it cannot be fixed. It's always moving. And when you try to describe something or define something, you're trying to... Yeah, nail it down to say what it is. But since this is always moving, always changing, it's impossible to give it a definition. And also impossible to give it a definition because when you define something, you, all, you also say by implication what it is not. But if there is nothing which the Tao is not, then it's impossible to define it because any definition has to be put in opposition with with yeah, its opposite. But if Tao has no opposite, then it can also not be talked about. It can also not be described. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a question about it. Can I ask it? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Uh, even if uh, it's not possible to describe the Tao with words, uh, and every time we try to define it, we betray it, it could it could be worthy and I don't know useful to try to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> uh, I was thinking now about the philosophical practice. In a way, is so, something similar. We try to define. We we ask a definition. We work with uh, thoughts and ideas, mm -hmm. and I think it's worthy and useful. But I like this idea about the Tao as well, that is not uh, speakable. So I was wondering if uh, uh, attempt to, to, to speak about it, could, like we are doing now, by the way, it could be worthy. Yeah, so what, what would it give us? <laughs> What's the worth in talking about it? The worst, the worst, the worst. If it's worthy, ah, the worst. What's the uh, worst? 
maybe we could reconcile with our, our finitude, our uh, the limits of our knowledge, of our mind, our thinking. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. <laughs> For an absolutist like yourself. <laughs> practice. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nice. So someone else with an idea about this? Yeah, Anna? Well, it's very close uh, from Andrea's idea, but I think one of the works is to not absol absolutize the philosophical practice and yeah. not to give it uh, omnipotency. But yes, that's what you said, and to, to not forget about our finitude and reconcile with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Yes. Do you think there is a tendency to see the practice as omnipotent? Yes, for some, I think. Yeah. Well, I think for, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think for some people, it's like uh, the, I don't know, the, the key uh, activity uh, to analyze everything. And, uh, and well, Thinking is is always about trying to grasp something in a way. So yes, I think it uh, and it it's always through words, through language. So if we if we enjoy the really the concept of da of Dao, we should be able to uh, to uh, accept, not to try to overthink maybe mm, yeah and do you think there's a special category of people who sees it as omnipotent or it's you know a bit random who does and who doesn't um well i think it's yeah mostly maybe the intellectual people who I don't know, maybe are fascinated by the the control among the word that thinking seems to have. And they, I include myself, again, tend to forget that, well, it's just thinking after all. And so what is missing in this scheme of putting thinking on a pedestal? Um, I would say just contemplation, maybe. Contemplation, yeah. So, what does yeah. contemplation? What does contemplation give, which thinking doesn't give? Um, some. Maybe some uh, union, some some union with the world, and thinking puts yourself in separation with the world. When you are thinking, you put a distance, be it with the world you take as an object, be it with yourself. So there is some distance. Whereas when you contemplate, you are not creating any distance with the world. You are just in it. Mm -hmm. Would detachment and attachment be relevant concepts or it's not exactly what you're talking about? Um, yes, I think it, uh, well, it's, it's different uh, than the concept I've I've used between separation, I think, and union, mm -hmm. but still, it uh, yes, it can go. But I don't know if uh, all 
thinking in itself is attachment. I don't think so. No, thinking would be detachment in that case. Oh, okay. Since you said it's a separation. Yes, yes, okay. But then would contemplation be attachment to the world? I don't think it fits because no. uh, if you are attached, you are not in contemplation anymore. Yeah. And you, if you are attached, um, in a way you separate yourself from the pure presence of what is because you, you expect uh, something, maybe. Yeah. Um, no, okay, so separation and union. Yes. You would explain it better. Yes. Yeah, okay. Good. Anyone who wants to contest this idea, if you like it. No, no one. Okay. So let's keep it. So let's check um, someone else. Let's check uh, um, Caroline here. You're number three, the thing you had a problem with, with difficulty with. So can you read it? Um, some of the connections that also makes her a little bit difficult for me to understand. For example, when he writes, great means passing, passing means receding, receding means returning. Um, I didn't understand like how great equals passing if he's referring to death or that the sovereign also pass away. And then who are the sovereign? Like, is it God or is it just nobility? Or is it humankind that believe that elevated somehow a lot of questions yeah no i went down a rabbit hole of confusion yeah well let's let's start with the first one how does a great equal passing anyone has an idea Right before it, it's where he says, to identify it, I call it Tao. First to describe it, I call it great. Okay, so the Tao is great, and great means passing. So what is that? Anna, you have an idea? Well, it's just that it's a, it's a Tao, it's not a God or some uh, humankind, uh, humankind, noble humankind, as uh, Caroline uh, asked. Yeah. You think that's relevant to clarify, to, to answer the question, how great means passing? Um, sorry, what, what question? Which question? Uh, her first question, how does great equal passing? Um, yes, it uh, makes sense to clarify it. Yes, uh, sorry, I was referring to the, the end. Okay, so explain why, why is it a good idea to clarify this? Um, because uh, it can appear as... Uh, contradictory the concept of greatness and of passing mm -hmm. if we think passing is is death and maybe uh, passing here refers more to um, uh, 
change becoming as we see that it's a key principle in this text mm -hmm. and also because it's it's not probable that it's death because we see that it's a passing which gives place to something else it's not an absolute end there is a movement yeah but can we say that there is movement also including death there is not an absolute end um yes yeah well, we can say that the, the dust we become uh, will nurture the the hearth yeah it's not uh, <laughs> for example but you think uh, it's it's doesn't make so much sense to think that the, it's a death here passing well actually it make it's yes it can make sense uh if we as you said if we consider it not as absolute but as a movement uh which belongs to life yeah Yes. So then it's not reduced to just the death of a person or a sovereign, but yes. it's in a, in, a, in a greater scheme. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And does it also fit with the following lines that passing means receding and receding means returning? Yes. And how, how does it fit? Well, um, well, it shows this idea of of passing of death as a, as a, as a mov movement, a transition, more than an ending. It's more a transition to another state, mm. to another part of movement. Yeah. But then, okay, death can be an example of it. Is it necessarily death or it can be something else as well? This passing. Mm. I think I think it can be death and change mm. in a general way. Yeah. I don't know if in if in English passing uh, usually means uh, death or no i don't know well i mean it can but not necessarily okay okay so caroline what do you think does this make sense not yet <laughs> because yeah. how does so if the tao is let's let's just see what uh, first of all did you understand Anna's... Yes, I understood what Anna was saying. Okay. Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> was there something? I mean, I, I think I understood. Yeah, okay. But if you say you think and kind of, it sounds a little bit insecure. Yeah. I so mean... is, is there something which you're doubting, which you think, okay, this maybe wasn't so clear to me? No, her explanation was clear. I'm just still a bit confused for myself. Yeah, so what is confusing you? I'm not even sure I know. <laughs> um no, but okay, let's let's see. What what did you understand of Anna's explanation? Can you make a short little summary of it? I don't think I could. Well <laughs> if you say you understood most of it, you, you should be able to but then... give something, right? <laughs> Yes, so... So just go with what you think you understood. That Tao is... Mm, let me go back to the text quickly. So if Tao is great, he, it, that thing, means everything 
I don't know if I can explain it. But this passing, do, do you have an idea what this passing means? Uh, as Anna was explaining it. So it's more than just death, or not even death at all. But I'm not sure where it's passing or what it's passing. Let's see, is there anyone else who can make a little summary of Anna's idea? No? Yes, Ian, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, as I understood, uh, Tao is uh, becoming, changing. So um, I more saw this uh, passing as uh, motion. Uh, I know that in English uh, you can say somebody passed away, which means death. But precisely it is used this verb probably to say that uh, death is also a motion into, I don't know, another world, another dimension. So... Uh, uh, I don't see necessary here that what is great will die or will pass away, will not be great anymore. But greatness, it means this passing, rec uh, receding, returning, not being fixed. And why would it be great to pass, to recede, to return, to pass, to recede, to return instead of being fixed? What would be the greatness of that? Uh, I would use probably, I don't know, uh, something uh, alive. This is life or creation. Yeah. And uh, uh, probably Lao Tzu, when he says great, he tries to move away from the prejudice we have about the great about the big statues the big rulers but instead he says that the real greatness is in this continuous motion in all direction like uh, passing and then uh, returning because this is what life the fundamental substance of of life and yeah. Death, I would say, is just one species of, of life or of this motion. Yeah. But death is part, part of it. Yeah, it's part of, of Tao. Yeah. Okay, good. So, Caroline, did you understand this? Ian's idea? Yeah, I did. I did. I, well, I hope I did. Yeah. <laughs> so... So you, you did, or it's, it's just a hope? Kind of both. So, uh, okay, pick, so pick, I think... Pick one. I th pick, pick one. Would you say you understood it, or is it just a mere hope that you did? I want to say I understood it, but chances are I didn't. Yeah, but choose. So let's say yes, just for the sake of argument. Let's say yes, I understood it. And do you believe it? Yes. Yes. Good. <laughs> so tell me what 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 did you say? In so, your so Tao is what's like in between the beginning or what does it say? Before heaven and earth, all of that. So it's life. And life means or Tao means great, which means passing and ebbing and flowing, like moving through the motions and going, receiving, giving, coming back. So life is Tao, Tao is great. Life is great. <laughs> can, you see, can you see the greatness in this circular movement? Yes, because it's better than being stagnant or stuck somewhere. Yeah. 
And can you give a concrete example of something passing, receding, returning, passing, receding, returning, coming, going, coming, going? Can you see this in the world? Yes. Where? It could be in nature or in our lives. Yeah. In nature, how does it work? Like um, the life cycles of things or the lunar cycle, the oceans. Yeah. How it all fits together. Indeed, yes. And the seasons. Yeah. yeah. And how, like, the ecosystem, how one thing needs something else and mm. it needs something else. Yeah. Yeah. So you're okay with the idea? Yeah. That great equals passing. Yeah. And then you need to add the other things as well and receding and returning and see it as a, as a circle, circular movement. Yes, I get that now. Yeah. Okay. Good. Anything else we need to clear up? For my part? Yeah. I think I'm good for now. Good for now? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So anyone else on this idea? No? Okay. Yes, Andrea. Uh, okay. Uh, what I understood from uh, Anna was that uh, accepting the becoming, passing, is a kind of death. I don't know. Let's ask Anna. Is this what you said? No. No. It's a nice, nice idea, but it's not mine. So, um, yes. Andrea, what's, what's your idea here? Uh, maybe that's my idea. I'm projecting to Anna this one. <laughs> so can you explain your idea? How does it work? Uh, in a way, when you accept becoming, you you are not something that remains or try to control something, or you don't define yourself as something. You don't. So in a way. Yeah, you accept you change anytime and you you're not stuck in uh, any condition anymore. And uh, uh, so you are not yourself anymore. <laughs> so, yeah. how, how are you not yourself? Uh, because in order to be yourself, you need an identity. An identity is something that is uh, uh, it cannot change in a way. If you change, you're not yourself anymore. And by accepting becoming and passing, you are changing a, all the time. Is a bit like Heraclitus uh, said. Is a uh, you are not the same when you go into the river the river the water is not the same you are not the same so everything is changing yeah. is a pantare yeah. so you give up the self yes yeah in a way giving up the self is uh accepting to die maybe something like that mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So acceptance is that the concept for this? Yes, acceptance. Yes, the flow. The uh, yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. Which is a way to giving up with yourself at the mm -hmm. same time. Yes, indeed. Yes, if you accept this circular movement, it follows you have to accept death as well. 
yeah, that maybe is part of this circular movement. Yeah, yeah. indeed. It is. Yes. Okay. Please. You wanted to add something else? It's, it was this idea. No, I would just to add that sometimes misunderstanding can bring some new ideas. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and projection as well. <laughs> Using other people. Are... <laughs> I, I don't know, maybe maybe you're not so egotistic here. You credit other people with your own ideas. <laughs> maybe, yes. I'm generous, yes. Yeah, yes. Good. <laughs> Okay. So something else on this idea. No. So let's check another one. Okay, we have Ian's here. You are number three, your difficulty. Can you read it? Yes. Uh... The last part of the text is difficult to understand. How can, how can one know the world without exploring it? And why does one know less when going further? Yeah. So maybe should I read like this, the last part? Uh, yeah, why not? Uh, without going out the door, know the world without peering out the window, see the heavenly Tao. The further one goes, the less one knows. Therefore, the sage knows without going, names without seeing, achieves without striving. Yeah. So it's, it's mainly about uh, knowing the world without going into the world. Mm -hmm. And even the, let's say, the opposite is true. The more you go into the world, the more you know less or you confuse yourself. And that idea is strange to you. Uh, yes. Uh, you, can, you can have, let's say, an idea of what the world is, like... Uh, a pre, like a, a doxa or how, an opinion, yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, not necessarily a knowledge, unless you go into the world. Yeah, you're an empiricist. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think. You're not a Platonist. <laughs> Uh, well, the world, maybe as Lao Tzu uh, in this text, seems to be something empirical. The world, I'm not sure if the world is equal to Tao. I'm not sure it is. Uh, like Tao, it's more fundamental, which you can know from your room. But the world, it's uh, the effect of Tao. It's the, the empirical effect. Mm -hmm. And if you want to know the world, not only Tao, maybe you should go to the world. But, yeah. But the way he uses the world here, I think he's only talking about the physical world, or it could include other things as well. Um, yeah from 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 this part actually it seems to make a connection between tao and the world because the first verse says without going out to the door know the world without peering out the window mm -hmm. see the heavenly tao no so does it seem like he's only talking about the physical world you can see or Something else as well. I think something else. Yeah. Mm. Then how would it be possible to know it without going out the door? Yeah, I'm not sure. No. Yeah. Let's see if someone has an idea.
How could you know this? The world, not just the physical world, but all of it, without coming out of the door. And why could actually going out of the door be a problem in order to see it? Uh, Anna? Uh, maybe uh, go going out to the door to know the world is a problem because we are in an attitude of uh, expectation of uh, getting knowledge. And we see in this text that um, wanting to reach knowledge, on the contrary, a fast us from it. Wanting to grasp the Tao, trying to grasp it, um, a fast. I don't know if it's the word. Mm -hmm. um, separate more um, us from from it. Yeah. And so we should not try to know the the Tao or the word as we try to to know things ordinary ordinary uh, normally. We want to observe it, to make research, to try to grasp it. It's a different form of knowledge, which is paradoxical. Yeah. And so I think that in order to, to know it, we just have to change our attitude and drop the, the, the try of grasping it. Mm -hmm. And when you don't try to grasp it, there could be a possibility of grasping it. Yes. Yeah. So Ian, does this make sense? Um, no, uh, I think it's it's a different uh, it's a different concept. Uh, what Anna's uh, speaking about it's about the attitude scientific attitude but for example you can uh, you can stay in the room and just resolve mathematical equations so you don't go <laughs> out uh, your door but can the attitude get in the way yes i think scientific attitude get in the way of knowing you know yeah this this world which he's talking about yeah yes but you can still do it uh, inside your room you can it, it, it no, can still you can, fulfill you can, you can these conditions but uh, you know this this text is a bit paradoxical huh. you saw yourself you thought it was strange but but can you can you see the idea the, the poetic idea of going out the door in order to know the world would be to assume this empirical attitude i'm going to examine it and that could actually be a, a hinder to know it this idea does it make sense for me let's say scientific attitude is not does not equal to uh, going out the door no but forget about your <laughs> narrow attitude of what scientists do or don't do. Can you try to be a little bit more, you know, poetical? <laughs> and can you see this? And remember, this was, you know, two and a half thousand years ago. So uh, they didn't have scientists in white coats in labs and so on. So can you see this going out the door in order to know the world as an example of the scientific attitude? Uh, yeah, maybe the explorers. The uh, explorers, yes. Okay, let's take the explorer instead of the scientists. Or yeah. a ship or a camel through the desert. I'm going to explore the world and know the world. But okay. yeah, actually, they will only see the physical world. 
yeah, maybe they thought they will learn something new and fundamental about the world by going to new places that they never been. Mm -hmm. But what uh, Lao Tzu's suggestion that uh, no, you'll not know nothing new fundamental. What is fundamental is here in your room, in your own yard, and also there on the desert or on the moon. And the opposite, this expectancy will confuse you that it's not the, the case. And you said it yourself in the beginning, that there's a unity between your being and the world. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yeah. If there is this connection, then you could you know, learn about the world by staying in your room without peering out of the window. Mm -hmm. If the world is in you. Uh, yeah, I think I think I see. Yeah. But if the yeah. further one goes, if you, you know, go out into the world and try to know it, the less you know it. Because you, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Yeah. And you forget you forget about uh, the Tao which is present and moving everywhere. Because you believe that if you go to that North Pole, you learn like missing puzzle of Dao. But in fact, the missing puzzle, it's it's not there. <laughs> it's here oh. under your nose. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and it is there as well. It's everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. In this sense, uh, if he uh, uses the metaphor of explorers, uh it makes sense it's clear yeah oh, okay yes yeah so it's yeah just to try to make sense of the ideas make sense of the metaphors yeah and um, see what what kind of world it is that he's talking about I'm thinking if this is also actual for for the current era when we uh, try to observe like uh, strange phenomena with black holes that uh, uh, let's say the dimension of the universe where the rules of space of and time are do not make sense. So I'm trying to think if when we discover such elements or quantum physics, that again, the rules of uh, uh, deterministic matter, again, they don't make sense. So are these examples uh, knowledge of like new knowledge about the world or not? And if it is not new knowledge about the world, then what is it? I mean, maybe it could say that there are some uh, some moments or some dimensions in the physical world where the law of physics stop. But before we we thought, okay, the laws of physics in the entire matter. Now, do you connect that to this passage forty seven? Yes, I, I'm wondering. This this was my question that if it applies to today's uh, explorations uh, or not. Uh, and what do you think? And by finding these uh, quantum fixes and black holes, do we did we do we gain any fundamental knowledge about yeah. Tao, about everything that is or not? Yeah, well, <clears throat> there's another Chuangzi story. Someone asked him, "Where where is the Tao?" And Chuangzi said, "What in the roof and the tiles?" I forget what. So low, he wanted some grand answer. 
what so low? The choice said, well, it, it's in the grass, in the dirt. What? He said, even lower? The choice said, it's in the shit and the piss. And the guy just left. Don't look for Dao in black holes. Dao is everywhere. Ah, okay. Uh, okay, yeah. It's, it makes even more sense. <laughs> it's, yeah, actually, the more we discover, let's say, surprises in the universe, the more we see that, yeah, this is what it, Dao is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, good. So, any other ideas about this? Andrea? Uh, I have another hypothesis to try to explain why going out of the door could be a problem. Okay. Which is uh, that by going out of the door, uh, you're not considering yourself part of the, the DAO, part of the box, in a way. So you are... Uh, it's a bit arrogant, in a way, because uh, it's like to say, okay, I can go out from this, and I can see from outside, which is a bit the, the God view. <laughs> and it's a bit the scientific uh, yeah, uh, view, or maybe the traditional one, the... Uh, yeah, the Newton, New, Newtonist one. Yeah. So you interpret this going out as stepping outside and viewing the world from a distance. Yes, and um, by not considering yourself as uh, as part of the, yeah the, the the world. Or, or by the way, you are not considering your singular point of view yeah yeah maybe you are projecting maybe yeah in a way you are not knowing yourself <laughs> you're not considering yourself yeah yes okay so you're distancing yourself from the world yeah you don't see yourself as part of the world yeah yeah, yeah. okay yes nice Okay, yes, Anna? Yes, about uh, what uh, Jan said, um, I think it makes sense to read this text and make it uh, echoes with uh, our current situation when we have so much discoveries, uh, more precise and precise, for example, in quantum physics. And when it said, the further one goes, the less one knows. It's uh, precisely the situation where we are, because uh, we know further about the quantum uh, particles, but the less we can make sense of it and try to find one big principle of, uh, of being of the world. So in a way, uh, yes, we, we still today <laughs> uh, have this experience is experience of the impossibility of reaching the Tao of so, or some absolute principle. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, so it's a description of the current situation in the human condition wanting to know more and more but the more we try to know it the less we actually know yes that's the idea yeah okay good andrea yes just a, a quick thing i really like the anna's idea and i think it's a good link with uh, anna arendt by the way yeah. when uh, she wrote that uh, we we cannot even speak uh, and and think about what we can do. So in a way, yes, this knowledge, which this techno technology, uh, are uh, creating uh, 
a great distance between ourselves and the world, the nature, the earth. And now we are uh, paradoxically more, uh, it's more difficult to understand it and to, to link ourselves with the nat our nature. So we are more distant. Yeah, we are more far away from ourselves, our nature. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I agree. So let's see, Andrea, you had a second question. Okay, but maybe we clear this up now. Uh, yes, I think it was similar uh, to, to Ion's question, yeah. Yeah. So the further one goes, the less one... Um, the less one knows. Yes, it's clear now. Yeah. Okay, good. So anything else in this text which is, which is unclear? Difficult to understand. No. Oh, okay. So let's look. No, Hannah, you had something. Oh, it's just. It's not that it's not clear. It's there is something a bit um, puzzling. I think in in this text, when um, it says. Uh, so humans follow the laws of earth, earth follow the laws of heaven, heaven follows the laws of Tao, Tao follows the laws of nature. Yeah. I was a bit surprised because I thought that in this vision, Tao was the principle. And so to see that it is submitted to the laws of nature, yeah. it's like nature is the principle. Mm. So it was a bit uh, intriguing. Yeah. yeah, it's not so clear in, in this tradition what what comes first and what is prim mm -hmm. primary and so on. And there are different ideas in different different texts and so on. But uh, basically, everything starts with the uh, wintum which is kind of the, the Greek chaos, which is nothing is ordered. It's just a, some kind of, yes, un, undefined, undifferentiated, whatever, being. Uh, and then, according to tradition, it was uh, split. There was a character called Pingu, I think it was called, which was born in the Hundun, uh, in the middle of it. And as he grew, the Hundun was split. So it became heaven and it became earth. So they had first a differentiation between heaven and earth. And then uh, the body of this Pingu gave, uh, became when he died, it became um it's called the ten thousand things or sometimes the myriad things and that's basically the physical world so everything that exists in the world it's the ten thousand things so his body became the physical world the ten thousand things and then you had rivers and you had mountains and you had uh, trees and you had stones and um, all of that but then where the Tao comes in and what it, what it gives rise to what is is not so clear. And then you also have the principle of yin yang, where you have these two opposing forces. You have yin, which is dark, and yang, which is 
bright and yin which is female and yang which is male and yin which is cold and yang which is warm and so on but they change to each other so it's not nothing is completely yin or completely yang and yin can become yang and yang can become yin so it's a kind of mechanism which try to make sense of this because there is a differentiation out in the world but there are different things there is light there is dark and there is big there is small and so on but the, the nothing is fixed nothing is absolute so everything is transient everything can become something else and something which is big is also small in perspective of something which is bigger and something which is cold now can be warm later and so on so this yin yang metaphysics works as a kind of regulating principle here but what comes first? Does the yin yang come first? Does the Tao come first? And is, is the Tao the fundamental force which governs everything? Or is the Tao um, part of nature? Um, is, is Tao creating the world? Or is the Tao created by the world? And in Confucius, we can read that Tao is created when men are using the Tao. The Tao is nothing in itself. Tao only exists by things being in the Tao. So if there were no things, if there were no people, there would be no Tao. But Tao, it's, it's still, it's it's a force kind of in itself to be reckoned with. So it's 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 all very confusing here. This again is difficult to talk about it, and it's difficult to say which is what and give a clear definition. Which came first? Well, it's impossible to say which is bigger, which is more fundamental, which is primary, which is secondary. So you cannot really say. And then they say different things in different traditions. So yeah, here, Tao follows the laws of nature. Okay, in this line, it looks like nature comes first. But then in another place, it it's, looks like it's the opposite. It's coherent to not be able to grasp it. <laughs> so it's, it's coherent in its incoherency, yes. Yes. So let's just accept it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. So let's take a look at your writing. There was one question I wanted to look at. Um, uh, yes, it's Eons number two. So this is mainly a question of formality and not about the content of the answer. But I have a little formal issue with, oh, sorry, picking on you here, Ian, but I have a little formal issue just with with your answer here, number two. Let's see if, if someone sees something. Graham, you have an idea. Uh, yeah. Uh, I see a little problem. Which one? Like, uh, when uh, Ian writes this, this situation poses the question about nature, about what substance in this transformation. Um. In a way, it a bit con contradictory uh, to the fact that we are in an era and deeper transformation and production of the artificial, 
which is a consequence of the fact that we are not thinking enough about it. So in a way, it seems not to be, I, I don't know, uh, is that clear? No. no, it's a contradiction between what and what? Uh, the fact that uh okay uh how about no i'm not clear to myself neither so No, I see no contradiction here. Yeah. Okay, maybe it's just a problem, I don't know, in the last part when he says uh, that lousy text offers a path of, to which we can find the answer. Yeah. And I don't know, the fact that the DAO is not uh, stable and in a way it's... I think it poses a problem with this idea that uh, is offering us a path to find the answer. In a way, when we find the answer, we are not grasping the DAO. So we are. Uh... So maybe here is the problem in the last part. No. Um, okay, but then then it's about more about the content here. Yeah. That uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Using Eon or not having sufficient knowledge about how, how the DAO works. Yeah, it's not formal. You're we're asking for a formal problem, right? Yeah, okay. I the, the one I see, okay, it's 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 related to content. But it's 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 this last sentence. Anna, you see something? Well, I think he just don't uh, doesn't answer the question. He's not showing how the text is relevant. Mm -hmm. So it's an uh, incomplete argument. He just uh, announced, just said, yes, it's relevant. And he said, um, he only speaks about the today the actual situation, but he doesn't um, explain the link with the text. He, he just uh, 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 say, says there is one. Yeah. So he makes a connection to the text, or at least he says that there is a connection. Yes. But you think he doesn't explain which one? No. Yeah. Yes, so Ian, you see, you get the idea? Uh, or it's not yes, clear? I just say that here is the the topic which, you know, <clears throat> makes the relevance of the text and today but go find it yourself in the text <laughs> yeah, <yes. laughs> yeah you're saying this this is a problem we have today and in life's his text we can find the answer <laughs> okay but what what's the answer then how uh, how is it relevant yeah you're just saying it's relevant because we can find the answer there but yeah you you you're leaving too much out. You should at least hint for what, what in Lao Tzu's text is, is relevant. You see? Mm. Yeah. Um. <laughs> do, do you have an idea? Is it something you could add? Just a sentence? Um. 
let me think. Yeah, maybe I I, <laughs> I try to be like uh, there. Let's say many examples in the text, so I didn't want to leave one out. And instead of by my trying to give all examples, I give none. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so do you do you have a synthesis? Well, now it's difficult. Well, I'm tempted to say Powell or Lao Tse offers, but it, it will contradict. I let's say I want to say that the Lao Tse solution or Uh, answer to this problem is uh, let's say trying to know tau or to know the 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 world without going outside the world yeah. but it's it's still too too vague yeah, but at least it's it's better Yeah, in a way, it's, it's vague if you don't get the idea. Yeah. Or, but but since we have discussed this idea, I think they, this could make sense. It's an opposite direction of what we're doing today. This could be, whether you like it or not, this could be at least a suggestion of another way. Or maybe, uh, I think, a better one. Uh, Lao Tzu uh, will say that nature is that which cannot be controlled. So uh, even if we try to con control, let's say, genetics or biogenetics or, uh, I don't know, uh, machines to mimic thinking, that will not be nature because by definition, nature is something that cannot be controlled. And in its fundamentally, there's always some be something that will go out of our control. So that is what subsists the artificial. Yeah. Okay, so next time you answer a question, make sure that you fill it with a little bit more substance. This. <laughs> yes. Okay. Good. Um, so we have 15 minutes left, and since this is the last session, I would like you, if you want to, just to maybe write a few comments in the doc about these sessions, what it gave you, if it gave you anything, if you found any anything useful or good about it, or as well, if you think that's something we could have done differently, or if you have some tips for the next time we do it, and so on. So. So if you have any reflections to give, I would be would be happy to have it. So I'll give you a few minutes to yes, write down some reflections, some ideas.
Okay. So I'll read later what you wrote. But anyone who would like to say something? Maybe some highlight from the text. Something you want to give us orally. Andrea. Uh, yes, just two ideas. Uh, I uh, appreciated the the exercise you proposed to us every time uh, related to the text, and uh, I did uh, uh, this experience often that uh, after the first read the text, the text was still far away and obscure, but after the exercise. Uh, I noticed that I was more into the text. It was more clear for me. Sure. And, uh, so that was uh, interesting. And I I thought to, to try to copy the, this format for my students as well. I think uh, it could be helpful for them in order to understand better the text they, they have to read. And and the second idea is, uh, yeah, the yeah, discussion. Before, just before we go to the second idea. Uh, do you do do you do this yourself when you read a text and it's difficult? Did you try to write some questions to the text yourself and then answer them in order to get into the text better? No, I don't usually do it. Well, uh, I, 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 I used to um, make some schemes out from the text I read, any text, but uh, I don't uh, uh, raise questions about it, but I think it's uh, something I, I want yeah, to, to do it because uh, it's very useful. Yeah, in, I, I'm more focused when I try to answer a question than when I just read the text. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. You had another idea? Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> See in a similar way during the the workshop, I realized how the discussion about the text, uh, how uh, different perspectives are very um, useful in order to find new meanings, new ideas about the text. So, in a way, uh, yeah, the text is something that uh, if you relate uh, in a like uh, by. Uh, answering question or by discussing with other people is something that uh, is never ending process that you can yeah use in order to find something new at any time yeah. and uh, it was uh, fun yes and even in short extracts like this yeah yes yeah yeah, yeah. nice thank you Anything else? Yeah, Ian. Yeah, I um, <clears throat> I had an idea after we discussed. Uh, uh, I think Sim Simon uh, Bell's text that initially when I read it, uh, I didn't value, let's say, in itself. It uh, I didn't quite like it. But uh, the discussion was so, let's say, intense. Uh, we all had uh, were full of ideas that we didn't have the time to get to the exercises. So this uh, made me realize that a text uh, is valuable not only in itself. Let's say when you read it and uh, try to get an immediate, uh, let's say, value or ideas but in the effects it produces and the discussions, interpretations, and uh, let's say debates that will follow up. So this was a good, uh, that's an idea that uh, I don't think I had it before or I've seen exemplified. What is the value of discussing ideas with others? <laughs> Uh, yes, but more like um, the text value is not necessarily immediate. It's unfolding, uh, yeah, with with more people. Yeah. When when it is discussed. Yeah. Yeah, the text is not finished when it's written. 
Yeah, pr probably. It's read. The more people read it, and talk about it, yes, it takes some more more meaning. Yeah. Yeah, it's a nice idea. Yeah. Something else? Yeah, Anna? Yes. Um, I, I enjoyed uh, very much the sessions, and I think uh, I come from the academy. I was a student in philosophy, and I always had uh, some struggle to dare to think really by myself when I read a text. I was uh, mostly, even today, a bit in a passive mode. And if I don't understand something, instead of trying to figure out by myself, I would try to ask for a professor or, or try to reach some knowledge. And so I enjoyed it very much um, just to, to, to take the text and to, to try to, to make something out of it only by the discussion and the questioning. And as I, I said uh, in my comment, I'm always fascinated when we don't understand some things, but thanks to the dialogue, thanks to the co-constrictions of a reflection, we manage to give meaning to it. We don't have to try to reach uh, external knowledge. Or... So, yeah. Yeah, we try to give give meaning to it, and not necessarily the meaning that was intended by the author either, mm -hmm. because we we don't know. Maybe. Yes, yes, indeed. Good. Thanks, Caroline. Any last remarks? Um, for me, it was interesting to see um, like how everyone's language and culture kind of played a role in how they interpreted texts or how they answered something or um, grappled with it or whatever. Like we all come from different places. So our narratives affect how we read into the texts or that kind of thing. So for me, that was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I like working with international groups. It's more, it's more fun than we just work with your own natives, but you're all from the same culture. Yes, it's a good point. Okay, so thank you. I hope I see you again. I'm sure we will be returning with a third edition of this reading course. In the summer, I should think, will be the next next time we do it. So I hope to see you then. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it was a great pleasure. See you. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.